And we are here for arraignment on, actually, it's a first submitted complaint. Mr. Cohen, Mr. Borthwick, have you received copies of the first submitted complaint? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Acknowledge receipt then? Yes, Wait for the reading and advisement? Yes. Not guilty pleas entered and denials to the special allegations. Thank you. Mr. Robichaud, can you give me your true name and date of birth, sir? Yes, sir. Grant William Robichaud. And Ms. Riley, likewise, ma'am, can you give me your full name and date of birth? Uh, sir, Laura Riley. Mark, wow. All right. So those two defendants look like they're out of central casting, right? Of course, they're in Southern California. It's Grant Robicho and uh, Carissa Riley. He's a doctor, a surgeon. Did a little thing on a, a reality show at one point. They are accused of drugging and raping a series of women. All right, those are the charges. Big investigation, big case, a lot of headlines out in Southern California. So now a new DA uh, steps in and evaluates the case. There's some issues with some of the accusers not wanting to go forward, not wanting to proceed in all this, creating problems for the DA. DA now doesn't believe that they can prove all the um, charges beyond a reasonable doubt. And there's a, a, a motion. They, they want to dismiss these charges. Prosecutors want to because they feel we've got uh, accusers, victims who don't want to come forward, don't want to testify, don't want to cooperate, all of that. Well, all of this gets the judge really, really angry. We're going to show you what happened inside the courtroom. Here it is. Let, let, let's move to a, a different issue. I, I want to know if the case is going to be prosecuted, if, and I know it's a huge if right now, by your office. Who is going to be the lead attorney on this case? If the case goes to jury trial, Your Honor, is that what the, the court is asking? The case goes to preliminary hearing. case goes to jury trial. At this, at this time, Your Honor, Ms. Martinez is the lead attorney on Thank this Thank you. Ms. Case. Martinez, I have a question for you. Have you ever prosecuted a sexual assault case when a victim has been uncooperative or did not wish to go forward? Yes, sir. You, you indicated that you worked in another county. What county did you work in? Marin County. Marin County. Marin County. Marin. Marin, okay. So yes, probably can I not tell a lot of sexual assault cases up there, right? Can I tell you about my experience? You did. With last, working you with... Did there, you did that last time we were here. Um, okay, so you did do that. Yes. At least once, right? Your Honor, Ms. Martinez was the head of the sexual assault unit in Marin County. She was a 15-year veteran DA of the Marin County DA's office. Ma'am, would you please have a seat? Ma'am, would you please have a seat? I'm talking to Ms. Martinez. Why are you interrupting me? Again, see, we're going back to this, this protocol. I think you folks understand what goes on in the Superior Court in the state of California. I am also a former court. deputy district attorney, Your Honor, excuse, and I... Excuse me. Excuse me. Don't interrupt the court, please. You, you, may, you may get to do that in civil cases. I'm not going to do that here. Okay. Ms. Martinez, would you agree that such a circumstance uh, regarding an uncooperative witness is not all that uncommon? Absolutely. Yeah, in and sexual it, assault cases. Would you agree? Absolutely. Okay. These women have been through a lot. And when I talk to victims... I have had so much experience, Your Honor, dealing with sexual assault victims. I have had a victim become suicidal okay. at the thought of testifying. I have had a victim become so riddled with anxiety that she loses her job. I have had a victim tell me that the thought of going to court and confronting her accuser causes problems in her personal relationship. And when they tell me things like that, and when they tell me I'm not going to do it, then I listen and I respect their wishes because that is only a decision that a victim can make. And I understand that. And I've told you, I started off by saying, more likely than not, I'm going to grant that. I can yeah. change that, but I just, the reason I ask you if you're, if you're familiar with that type of situation, you do realize that if, you, if, if, if the court denied the motion relative to victims two, three, and five, this is why you have investigators and possibly other witnesses testify as to the victim's comments and statements. That's impeachment. Have you considered doing that? They don't want to testify or they come in and say, I don't remember a thing. Fine. 
That's not an unusual circumstance at all. Very common, actually, not just in sexual assault cases, but in just about every kind of case out there. So once the prior statement's been given, and a lot of these statements I know are recorded, it comes in and doesn't carry any less weight. There's a jury instruction relative to that issue, but it doesn't carry any less weight. Have you considered that? To what end? I can put on, I can put on a 115 prelim and have the officers testify. Um, and then at trial, she's going to tell me the same thing she told me years ago. This is a case, this is not premature. This case has been going on for two and a half years. These women have had time to think about their decision. This is in no way pre premature. This is not a situation where the event just happened, we had to file it, and now we're 10 days and we're setting a prelim. And in that case, yes, go ahead. She has a lot to process. Let's put on the officer. This is not that type of situation. Why not? Because these women have been drugged through the mud. They had an elected official who was supposed to advocate on their behalf, basically drag their credibility through the mud. They were grossly mistreated by the DA in this county. And it is for many of those reasons that they don't want to deal with this process. And I'm not going to further push that issue if they told me I'm done. All right, so procedurally, uh, if they did not want to deal with the process and they just stayed home, you realize you could still call an investigator. Your Honor, the victims in this matter have... Well, hey, hey, hey. You're doing it again. Could you just let me finish talking to who might be trial counsel in this place? Go ahead. And again, Your Honor, I would say to what end? Because that's just at the preliminary hearing. But we have our eye towards okay. jury trial. That's what, look, this is fact-finding for me. All right? Just relax, everybody. It's fact-finding for me. All right? It's, 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 this is the real world. This is not NCIS or Law & Order on TV. Those things are fake. All right? Just, this is the real world. I have my due diligence I have to, that I have to do. And that's why I'm asking these questions. Counsel, back to you. Yes, Your Honor. Is corroboration of witnesses your concern? It is part of the concern um, in our motion. Are you familiar with CalCrim 301? I believe I am, Your Honor, but could you remind sure. me? Sure, okay. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't mean, have an encyclopedic knowledge. You know, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I, people try a lot of cases, know these off the top of your head. It's okay, I don't expect you to. <laughs> your Honor, and respectfully, <laughs> I have tried a lot of cases, Your Honor. I don't know what a lot is, okay. So, no, I'm, not going, I'm, not, I'm not judging your qualifications. Right. And, just, and, just, just. and I apologize for interrupting, Your Honor, but when the court makes comments like that, it, I, I do feel compelled to reassure the court. Then you need to get over it. CalCrim 301, which would, give, would be given to the jury states, it's given, it's a sua sponte instruction. All right. The testimony of only one witness can prove any fact. Before you conclude that the testimony of one witness proves a fact, you should carefully review all the evidence. You're familiar with that? Absolutely, okay. Your Honor. Right. And that witness also can be an investigator. All right. Are you also aware that a jury can be further instructed that with respect to charges of this nature, that there's no legal corroboration requirement in a sex event? Sex, yes. Sex offense, and that's people versus gamage. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Are you familiar with CalCrim? I'm not going to put you on the spot. CalCrim 223, 224, and 225. Those all relate to circumstantial evidence. Okay. Yes. All right. Have you considered those, the law in those instructions relative to making the decision to uh, request that those two, three, and five be dismissed? Yes. What is so unusual, and this is what I was talking about earlier when we brought this up, and different about this case, is that with the exception, and I'm asking if you've considered this also, with the exception of one alleged victim, at least from the cursory view that I've undertaken regarding the, uh, the facts, they all seem to have the same or similar history of what they say they occurred with both defendants. 
it's almost like a playbook. And these folks apparently never knew each other. I don't know if they know each other now. That's not important. It's not, again, it's not for this court to weigh or judge the evidence or credibility of the witnesses. But the court does look, as I mentioned before, to the four corners of the complaint <coughs> in considering whether or not in the interests of and furtherance of justice, magic words, right? Okay, we know that. Charges should be dismissed. How does that comport with your belief that the complaint should be amended? And as this court is aware, in order to proceed with criminal charges, the prosecutor has to believe that they are provable beyond a reasonable doubt on their own. There are, as this court is aware, specific jury instructions which tell the jury that they may not use other acts evidence to shore up charged complaints in order to meet that beyond a reasonable doubt threshold. And we have, and this court has found, we have undertaken an extensive review and analysis of this issue without any undue influence. We've been entirely objective. And our amended complaint reflects the results of our objective determination of this evidence. And we see this motion on the amended complaint as an opportunity for the court to free this case from the Rakakis Spitzer circus that it has been entangled in, as this court has acknowledged. Well, there may be a new circus now. I don't know how closely you read Ms. Martinez's brief or not, but that's something we're going to address also, whether or not there's now a political influence being brought in by the Attorney General's office. And, Your Honor, I authored the brief with Ms. Martinez, and there has been absolutely no political influence on our decision whatsoever, and there has been no evidence presented of any sort of political influence on our decision. You think a veiled threat to the court would be political influence from the Attorney General's office? It's just a yes or a no. Is the court indicating there was a veiled threat? I'm asking threat? you a question. If there was a veiled threat in your brief, do you think that would go to that issue? I don't think there was a veiled threat in our brief. I didn't ask Anna. you if there was a veiled threat. I asked you if there was a veiled threat. Do you think that would go to a political inference? Your Honor, I can't opine on a situation that I am not aware of. Okay. Normally, amendment, an amendment of this significance would come after the preliminary hearing. We all know that. And at the information stage, you know, after, if, if there's a bind over, then there's an information file, right? Yes. You familiar with that? That is normally how we do things, Your Honor. That's the only way to do things, right? There's no yes. other option, right? Sure. Okay. If there's an information, if there's a bind over, leave to amend would not be required because it would be an information, not the complaint. The complaint stage no longer exists. Do you recognize that the amendment to the complaint that you are asking for is an extremely significant change and quite unusual due to the significance of this proposed amendment? I mean, you're attempting to restructure the entire case. Your Honor. There, there seems to be comments from uh, from the people and from the defense that, what's the big deal? I think even Mr. Cohen said, yeah, and all the courts across the country. I had no idea, Mr. Cohen, you were so worldly. But I actually am, and we can talk about it. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to talk about well, it. You invited all <laughs> no, Sir, I didn't invite it. Please don't interrupt. I didn't invite anything. Across the country, everybody knows all you got to do is walk into a court, say, hey, judge. We want to amend the complaint by interlineation. And you know, that happens. I've done that all the time, Your Honor. And I see it more times than not. Rarely do I ever see a situation where the entire complaint is going to be restructured and we deal with that. This is not that situation. Folks, everybody needs to get a life on this. This is not a normal situation. Not normal at all, from the allegations to what's taking place now. Uh, judge not making a decision yet. That should happen sometime in July. We'll continue to follow the story for you right here on Court TV. When we come back, it'll be crime time. Don't go anywhere.